Okay, so welcome back again. Let's take a look at the concept check and then we'll talk about the consequences of meiosis, specifically focusing on the sources of genetic variation, which of course we understand to be the reason for sexual reproduction in the first place, to create genetic variation. So we really ought to look at where that genetic variation comes from. But let's take a look at the concept check, then. check question first. Compare and contrast the chromosomes of a cell in metaphase of mitosis with those of a cell in metaphase two of meiosis. Remember, technically speaking, these two look more or less the same, but are there some differences? Well, yes, we know that the individual chromosomes are going to condense out and those individual chromosomes consist of two sister chromatids. So when they line up on the metaphase plate, it's individual chromosomes lining up on the metaphase plate and each of those individual chromosomes contains two sister chromatids. But there the similarity ends because now the differences kick in. As a consequence of the crossing over um, step in prophase one and the exchange of DNA, um, when the, chromos the homologous pairs separate, we're going to have chromosomes in metaphase two that are going to have sister chromatids that are no longer sister chromatids. They're not going to be genetically identical to each other because they're going to contain a combination of DNA obtained from both, par both parental chromosomes because of the exchange. In terms of numbers, the chromosome number in a metaphase cell in mitosis is going, always going to be diploid. Well, not necessarily, because if we go back and take a look at the life cycles, remember that meiosis in the life cycles, in two of the life cycles, do not, does not give rise to gametes. It gives rise to haploid cells that themselves then undergo mitosis. They divide by mitosis to create genetically identical cells that happen to be haploid. So in fact, when we see cells in the metaphase of mitosis, they could be diploid or they could be haploid, depending on the origin of those cells. Whereas in metaphase, in and metaphase two, the cells are always haploid because they are the product of meiosis one where the chromosome number has already been reduced from diploid to haploid. So there are some differences. Um, and of course the chromosomes in metaphase or specifically the sister chromatids are genetically identical to each other because they are copies of the same parental chromosome something that is not necessarily the case in metaphase two. In fact, it rarely is because of the crossing over. So those are some things to, to bear in mind when you think about the chromosomes as they appear in cells in mitosis and in metaphase two that hypothetically are undergoing processes that are identical, but in fact, the cells do have some differences at the chromosome level. So let's get on and talk about sources of genetic variation, because as I said, that's the whole point of sexual reproduction to create genetic variation. So let's see where that comes from. It turns out that there are two specific sources of genetic variation. The first source is the way the chromosomes line up on the metaphase plate, or specific, more specifically, the way the homologous pairs of chromosomes line up on the metaphase plate during metaphase one. So remember, I've pointed out that each pair of chromosomes does its own thing. They line up randomly, could be blue on one side, red on the other side, or flipped around the other way but both orientations are perfectly legit. So this orientation for these chromosomes is just as legitimate as this orientation. Likewise, this orientation for these chromosomes is just as legitimate for these chromosomes. So these two orientations are perfectly legitimate and perfectly um, available and perfectly possible. 
And you might go, so what's the big deal about this? Well, the big deal is that depending on how these line up this way or this way, determines what combination of chromosomes you're eventually going to get in the resulting gametes. So if they line up this way on the metaphase plate, these two are going to go in this direction. These two are going to go in this direction. These two will go this way. And then when we get here, these two will go this way. And 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 as a consequence of this, you'll get gametes that contain all blue chromosomes or gametes that contain all red chromosomes. And those are per perfectly legitimate combinations if you get this arrangement. If you get this arrangement, then you're going to get combinations of red and blue. And you're going to wind up like this. And so you could get this combination of red and blue or this combination of red and blue. And that gives you four different combinations. That's from a, two pairs of chromosomes. And you might think, okay, that's fine. Is there a pattern to this? And the answer is, yeah, there's actually a mathematical formula. And the formula is very easy to use. So the formula is two to the power n, where n equals the number of homologous pairs. Or haploid number. And you might go, so why say haploid number? Well, it ha actually happens to be the origin of the letter N. Remember we use two N and N for diploid and haploid. So if we look at, at this cell for a moment up the top here, um, it has two pairs of chromosomes. So it's diploid number is four, but it's haploid number must be two, but that's also the number of pairs of chromosomes. So the haploid number and the number of pairs of chromosomes is exactly the same number, in this case, two. And if we apply the formula, this is two to the power n, where n is the number of, pair of, hap of homologous pairs, or the haploid number, well, that's two. So two to the power two is four, and there's our four possible combinations. And you might then ask, okay, so big deal. What, why are we making such a big deal out of this? Well, consider the human number. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But think about the formula. What is N going to be for a human? And what's the implication of that? More to come shortly. The other source of genetic variation, and one that is a little bit harder to um, predict, is probably the best term to use, is the whole notion of crossing over and this opportunity for exchange of DNA between the non-sister chromatids. So here you can see the formation of the chiasmata and here's a light, no, sorry, it's an electron microscope image. TEM is electron microscope. So here's an electron microscope of a um, pair of chromosomes in the, um, this, this is obviously in prophase one, I would imagine, because I can't see a spindle, so this would have to be prophase one. Um, and you can see that we have the chiasmata and therefore the crossing over between the chromosomes. And so when they separate um, in anaphase one, because there's this potential for the physical exchange of DNA, you wind up with two chromatids in each homologous chromosome that is now a combination, or the correct term that we use is recombination, of DNA from each of the two 
parental chromosomes. So one, we have one chromatid that is totally, in this case, um, if I remember rightly, this is the paternal or the father, father's side. So this one is totally um, unchanged and represents the chromosome as it was obtained from the father. This one is more or less DNA from the father, but it contains small parts of DNA co in combination coming from the maternal side or from the mother's chromosome. Over here in the other homologue, we have one chromosome that, because remember chromatid is a chromosome. So this is a chromosome that still intact as it was obtained from the mother. But then we have another chromatid, or as it will be a chromosome that contains still mostly mother derived DNA, but now in combination with some DNA from the father. Now, why is this important? Well, number one, you've created two new chromosomes that have never existed before because they are combinations of, of two chromosomes that were, as you'll see, unique to the individual who possesses them. But number two, remember what we talked about back when we were talking about what defines a homologous chromosome? That they are the same size, same shape, same location of the centromere. Um, they take up colored dyes in the same patterns. They have the same genes in the same loci, the same physical positions. But there is that one difference. They don't necessarily have the same flavors or alleles of the genes in the same locations. So here we have the homologous chromosomes derived from the mother and the father. The genes in these locations are the same genes, but what if they have different alleles? Well, now we've got different, we've got the same genes, but different alleles, and we've got different combinations. And we know that there is often um, interplay between genes and their alleles that are contained on the same chromosome. That's not unheard of. But even if they aren't, the individual that gets this chromosome is going to get a different combination of alleles, same genes, but different combinations of alleles as the person who gets this chromosome. And likewise over here. And so now you've added in a substantially unpredictable new source of genetic variation. Because the big problem with crossing over and this physical exchange of DNA is that we don't know when it occurs. We don't know where it occurs. We don't know if it occurs all the time. And if it does, we don't know how frequently. Best guess? is that it occurs about once per pair of chromosomes per meiosis division. Oops. This is the best guess that we've got. Because the problem here is we can't observe whether it's happened or not. Not before um, the offspring are born. We can see that it's happened after the offspring have, have appeared. And in fact, that's how crossing over was first recognized, not by seeing it in the, in the light microscope, because it's very, very difficult to observe in the light microscope without using colored dyes. But it was observed in genetics experiments that gave results 
that were unexpected and could only be explained in terms of there being physical exchange of DNA between chromosomes, something that prior to these experiments was thought to be impossible. And we'll actually talk about those experiments in chapter 15. Those are, are, or it's an experiment that we talk about early in chapter 15. Um, so we'll learn more, you'll learn more about that um, in an, an upcoming chapter. But the whole problem with crossing over is we don't know when it happens, where it happens, how frequently it happens. We just have a best guess based on observation of it, have, of it happening by looking at the offspring after the fact and recognizing that crossing over has occurred. So this is a random source of genetic variation. The arrangement of the um, chromosomes on the metaphase plate, on the other hand, is just a simple math issue. It's just probability and um, statistics. So remember the formula is two to the power n, where n equals the number of pairs. So for humans, n equals 23. So that gives us two to the power 23 possible chromosome arrangements. But that's actually chromosome arrangements in gametes. So it's really two to the power 23 possible eggs or sperm. And we're all capable of producing that number of different types of eggs or sperm. So these numbers apply to all humans. We all have this, this possibility of producing two to the power 23 different types of eggs or sperm. And the eggs or sperm that you make are unique to you. No one else can make the eggs and sperm that you make because no one else has the combination of chromosomes that you have because even your brothers and sisters do not have exactly the same chromosomes that you have because their genes may be a different possible combinations, unless they look the same as you do and are genetically identical to you. In other words, you have an identical twin, um, their combination of genes and on their chromosomes is different from your combination. And in fact, that only further illustrates this whole notion of the power of sexual reproduction. Let me move this up here a little bit so I can use the full slide. Because for a couple, number of possible offspring because of the because of the laws of statistics and probabilities is 2 to the power 23 squared now 2 to the power 23 um, in case you you've never calculated that number, two to the power 23 is 8,400,000. And we square that. 
So 8,400,000 multiplied by 8,400,000. And the answer for that is greater than $64 trillion. And this is true for every couple, right? Because remember, each, each individual in the couple brings their own two to the power 23 possibilities to the, to the table. And it's the result of which egg and which sperm out of those two to the power 23 possibilities then come together at fertilization to give rise to the individual. So what's the point here? The point is that you represent one of the 64 trillion predictable possibilities that your parents could have produced. Your brothers and sisters represent some of the other 64 trillion possible predictable outcomes. But remember, it's not just this that's causing genetic variation. It's also we have to remember the laying over the top of this, of that unpredictability of crossing over. Where it occurs, when it occurs, if it occurs, and how frequently it occurs. It just scrambles things even further. The 64 trillion possible outcomes, that's very predictable. That's just simple statistics. But then when we factor in um, the potential of genetic variation as a consequence of crossing over, then it becomes totally unpredictable. So the upshot here is that you are truly genetically unique. That's something to recognize because there has always been a subtle undertone with modern biology from, from some people that Biology and science in general has tended to negate our individuality, that somehow we are just an accident, just a statistical accident. Well, you could take that attitude if you wish, but when you look at these numbers and you recognize just how many possibilities there were when your parents decided to have you and that you represent just one of those almost infinite possibilities, yeah, maybe you are a statistical accident, but that doesn't negate the fact that you are truly, truly, truly unique. There has never been anyone with your particular combination of chromosomes and genes ever before. And there will never be anyone with your particular combination of chromosomes and genes ever again. Statistically, however you want to slice it and dice it, it's just not possible. You are truly unique, even if the only thing that you look at is your genetics. And remember that you are not just a product of your genetics, you're also a product of every lifetime um, event that you're ever going to experience. We are a combination of our experiences and our genetics. You can ask a lot of scientists which makes the greater contribution and you'll get all sorts of answers. There is no definitive answer to that. I can't even give you one and I won't even bother trying. But what I'm trying to emphasize here is that even if the only thing that you ever consider is your genetic uniqueness, it's incredibly significant. You are the only person with your particular combination of genes and chromosomes. Cherish that, value that, and do something great and grand with your life. Because with your genetic makeup that is truly unique to you, you are the only one who can do what you are capable of doing. You are truly unique. And you need to, to remember that. Don't let anyone tell you that you're some sort of statistical accident, because you're not. The statistics simply reinforce just how unique you truly are. And you need to remember that every day. So the reality is that genetic variation as a consequence of sexual reproduction, that's huge. 
possibilities are essentially endless. So that brings us to a look at, and I haven't included this in the PowerPoint, but I can talk about it nonetheless. The little rotifers called the deloid rotifers. Because these rotifers use a form of um, a form of asexual reproduction. And it's called parthenogenesis. So this is the big deal. There are no males in this population, even though in other types of rotifers, there are males and females that do reproduce sexually. But in the bedelloid rotifers, for about 50 million years, they've been reproducing as a female only population for each species. And those females lay eggs that develop into new females that are clones of, the, of, the, of their mothers. And the problem here is that 50 million year time span that they've been doing this. And we know that they've been doing this for about that long because of gen genetic analysis. We know that there is in fact genetic variation in their chromosomes and there is quite a substantial amount of genetic variation in their chromosomes compared to those rotifers that reproduce sexually. In those rotifers that reproduce sexually, there is less than 5% variation. It could be as low as 1%. But in the bedelloid rotifers, there can be up to 50% genetic variation in the chromosomes in an individual. And the question becomes, where does that genetic variation come from? Well, the argument has been um, mutation only. Just, just as we were talking about earlier, that could be the only source of genetic variation. Um, and for a long time, that was the accepted understanding of where the genetic variation comes from. We now know, in fact, that that genetic variation is a product of the way in which the chromosomes behave. They, they are capable of a lot more crossing over and mixing and matching. So that creates new chromosomes and the possibility of um, some genetic variation. But their party trick that I alluded to at the beginning of the presentation is that they can actually absorb DNA from their environment and incorporate that into their chromosomes. And it is in fact a source of genetic variation for these rotifers. And so they can actually use other organisms' genes or genes from other rotifers. Um, to create a level of genetic variation. And that is what we believe is the reason why they've been able to reproduce by parthenogenesis, by an asexual mechanism for as long as they have, for 50 million years, because they simply 
create genetic variation in a different fashion. They have been subject to a lot of research as a consequence of the simple observation that they were reproducing asexually for so long. Um, and it led to some interesting observations. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time to talk about that um, in this class, but it has led to some interesting observations as to what type of genetic variation actually turns out to be really, really important. Is it just genetic variation for the sake of genetic variation, or is there a specific target for this genetic variation? And it turns out that there is a specific target resistance to disease. Um, and if you take the general biology two class, if that's your intention, we do actually talk about that in some detail, or at least I talk about that in my class in some detail, because it's interesting as to what really is the necessity for genetic variation. Is it just genetic variation for the sake of genetic variation, or is there a target for this? It turns out that there may very well be a target, and that target is our ability to resist pathogens, and specifically through the immune system. So if you're, inter if you're going to take the, the general biology two class and you're interested in that, um, you're more than welcome to come and join me when I teach that next semester, which I will be. Um, but that's the nature of these bedelloid rotifers. They have other ways of generating the genetic, the genetic variation that they need in order to be able to continue to reproduce asexually. But for everybody else that reproduces sexually, um, it is the sexual reproductive process that leads to the genetic variation. And it's important because it's the basis for natural selection. Natural selection needs genetic variation because that genetic variation is the source of the um, character variations and the trait variations that natural selection is favoring or not favoring as the case may be, depending on what the environmental conditions are. So that's meiosis and that's the consequences of meiosis. Um, one more concept check before we're done for today and for this um, presentation. So let's take a look at the two questions and I'll give you the answers as we go. What is the original source of variation among the different alleles of a gene? So the only way that you actually get a new allele is by mutation. What an allele actually constitutes is a change in the nucleotide sequence that represents the sequence of DNA that we refer to as a gene. So a gene, or the physical position of the gene, the locus, is simply a length of nucleotides that represents information for the cell. When that sequence of nucleotide change, nucleotides changes through mutation, you now have a different version of that gene because it's got a different sequence of nucleotides, and so you've produced a new allele. So the actual source of all new alleles is mutation. It's the only source of new alleles, in fact. If a pair of homologous chromosomes have the same alleles for every gene, will crossing over result in genetic variation? And the answer is no, it won't. Because the genetic variation is a product of having different alleles for the, for the same gene on the two homologous chromosomes. Remember the whole notion of a homologous chromosome or a homologous pair is that they have the same genes at the same location, the same loci on the chromosome. Where they may differ is the actual versions of the genes. So if the versions of the genes are identical, then crossing over is simply exchanging the same version of the gene for the same version of the gene, no genetic variation there. It requires um, different alleles to be present for the same gene to give genetic variation. So if the alleles are the same, crossing over is not going to result in genetic variation. So that's it for this chapter. That's the reason why we need meiosis and how meiosis functions and the consequences of meiosis as part of sexual reproduction. So remember the 
reason why you need to be familiar with this and you need to be familiar with those concepts is because we're going to build on those in the next two chapters as we talk about inheritance patterns. So if you have any questions, con um, comments or concerns about anything that I've discussed in this presentation, by all means, come and see me in office hours or, be more, or shoot me an email. I'd be more than happy to try and clarify things for you. Um, otherwise, I will see you back here again when we talk about inheritance patterns and specifically the work of a man that you may have heard of before, an Austrian monk by the name of Gregor Mendel. I'll see you then.